what we're going to talk today is just to go in a little bit about how we got gotcha, here um, and uh, what we really expect and what we understand about host and host healing. Um, so that, that's going to be the main um, gist of our conversation today. Okay, so let me let me just check and we'll, and we'll get started in literally in, in one minute. Uh, just checking one thing. Okay. Right. Um, so let's start. Uh, I'm Peter, Peter Faber. Uh, I think if you saw a picture from some people may know me, uh, especially from our viewers in Greece. Um, but I've, I've yet to come out to New Zealand. I've had a number of New Zealanders working here over the years. Um, and if uh, if you can actually just ask any questions by using the panel on, on the right hand side. Okay, and we'll answer the questions at the end. Anyway, so I've had a number of Kiwis working for me over, over the years here in the uh, Scarsdale, and uh, they've always been fantastic guys, and we've had a great time. One second. Okay, so if, uh, if we go a bit more about myself, I've been placing implants since uh, 1991, and uh, Basically, was using allografts for my grafting uh, Rocky Mountain at the time, and it worked really well, and I had no problems. And uh, you know, but in those days, we we didn't really graft that much. It was uh, pretty much of hoping and finding where the bone was. Um, I've recently just resigned from the ADI, where I was the director, and uh, you can see we've done reasonably well. I uh, hope managing to uh, win some awards here with Minas Levensis, who has, who's our research manager, and he's an associate working with me here in London and a great friend. And recently, last week, we managed to um, uh, be awarded an honorary membership. This, I'm uh, the only the third non-president to be awarded the uh, uh, honorary membership of the ADI with Hill Tatum and Carl Mesh. So it's a, it's a real honor to be uh, awarded this with old friends at the ADR. You know, what we're going to talk about is about change as well. Um, a lot of things in life do change. This is a, a phone belonging to a friend of mine. Actually, oddly enough, this chap uh, teaches all the Formula One drivers how to drive uh, and how to optimize their cars. And you look at the phone that he's using, you know, and uh, I remember those and I loved it. I mean, we trusted it, you know, like a lot of graph materials that we've had for 20 years. But change happens, and it's called progress. And that's why I like uh, using my iPhone, because now I can get the internet. We can do so much more. And this is what we're going to be talking about, is changing for the pro sake of progress to improve our outcomes. And I'm going to explain to you why we need to be looking at this improved outcome. You know, sure, look, this car has worked well. We've had diesel for a long time, uh, you know. and. Some of these changes, this is my new car, some of these changes are hopefully better for our future and uh, dare I say a sort of more ecologically, ethically sound uh, approach to, uh, to doing things. Now where's my real influence come for developing synthetics and developing my whole practice essentially and all the dentistry I do around synthetic particulates? Well, it actually started with a very famous Englishman um, and and he did that program, uh, Letters uh, Letters from New York, which was a, a BBC program about an Englishman living in New York, effectively. Uh, and he was incredibly well known in the 60s and 70s. Um, but unfortunately, Alistair Cook's body was stolen, and uh, the body parts were used essentially by the New York New Jersey mafia, effectively. Uh, and involving a number of dentists and a number of uh, anaesthetists and uh, I mean they all uh, managed to um, face justice and I think the sentences were quite long like 30 years uh, which were given out to them. But what the effect it had on the UK was quite uh, staggering because at the time I had been using um, allografts from the American Bone Bank and then all of a sudden every patient came in and said I hope you're not putting some of Alistair in me. And 
this was quite difficult because everyone said it. it. It was really big news in England, probably more so than even in the United States, that the fact that body snatchers had been using parts for Alan Graf band uh, materials. So at that stage, I, I decided to look at a more um, ethical, more alter, uh, sound alternative that I could truly trust. Uh, and that's when I started at 2003, 2002, looking solely at synthetics and I look towards orthopedic surgeons and to also what they were doing and what orthopedic companies were making and that's why I got involved initially with with uh, Fortos Vital which was uh, essentially made by Biocomposites which was an orthopedic company and and uh, this got my interest going in beta TCP and calcium pro uh, sulfate products. Now the road's been a long road, you know, I've done, it's been 16 years since I first got involved and I've done probably five and a half thousand plus grafts. So it's been a long road and it eventually has led to the development of a product uh, over the last five years, which I feel finally fulfills the areas and, and which I've managed to have a hand in. You know, I've worked with many companies in the past, other companies making synthetic graphs and looking into synthetic graphs, companies in the UK and in Switzerland. Um, the problem really is, is whenever you want to change, it's so difficult to change something because of the difficulties in CE marking and regulatory issues. So I decided I'd rather build something that came from within, from me as a practitioner, rather than just getting graph material that was made by someone who then I had to adapt my techniques. So I'd already published a protocol, uh, or I've been working to a set protocol, which we'll go through, but I developed this material to just fit within that protocol to optimize the host uh, regeneration. Uh, and we're gonna see that as we're going through on how we managed to do this. Fortunately, we've managed to win a few awards and uh, you know, and we will hopefully continue to do so. And that's just a side effect. The main thing as a practicing dentist, dentist and practicing implant dentist, the priority is that I actually um, have effectively an efficient product that I could trust that's predictable. And before I actually pass any knowledge on to someone, any all of my colleagues, and before we start marketing a product, I wanted to make sure that it was predictable. So I used it for three years prior to selling on the market. So we're going to start off with, uh, I'm going to show you something dramatic to start off with, merely this is to show you about regeneration, okay, this is not a protocol, this is not for something for us to do, uh, I've done 130 cases like this over four years, we've uh, had a, a, a failure of the graft material in one due to an infection, but let's go through it and I'll show you about how we talk about uh, regeneration. So we've got a socket, little loss of buckle plate here, not much. Um, and yes, it's effectively a four wall, but we're mixing a wet mix, okay? You can make ethos wetter or drier, and I'll explain to you that in a minute. Now we're gonna place the implant, and we're placing this implant at dia 4.5, merely by pushing it in, so it's gonna have no bone to implant and no primary. You can see I don't overgraft. This is the key with these materials, it's regeneration. Here it is at 10 weeks. You can see we've got new bone growing. This is what it looks like on x-ray at 10 weeks. So there's still particles, but it's hard enough that we need a rounder to access the implant. Okay, and you can see we've got a new buccal plate and you notice we've got nice new buccal keratinous tissue. On Ostel at 11 weeks, 77. That's higher than I would have get if I actually put it in host bone. And the good thing about here is you can see we have preserved the tissue and we've managed to preserve the, the soft tissue due to preserving the hard tissue. When we run through the x-rays, you can see where we've placed it, no bone to implant, no primary, 10 weeks, you can see it turning over, now it's loaded at 12 weeks. When we put it into function, it further turns over to host bone, so uh, due to the actual loading, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, about the research of Sasaki. Okay, so, here it is at two years loaded, and now what's happening, at 10 weeks, we'll look at our material, and you, we'll show you that there's um, only 10 to 12% of residual graft material at 10 weeks. So by two years, there's hardly any graft material in three years. And here it is loaded 
at four years. Okay, so look, essentially, the key of this is preservation and regeneration. So we're, we're basically trying to preserve as much of the tissue, and this is why we'll go into the protocol later and how we use a three weeks uh, soft tissue healing period. Uh, and, and that's to try and preserve as much of the host's original bone as we can. And then by using these materials to upregulate the host healing, we then regenerate the tissue. And if we're regenerating true host bone, that's host will then regenerate keratinized uh, buccal uh, attached keratinized tissue. Okay, so what we're going to talk about guided bone regeneration. I like those three words um, because they're often um, slightly misunderstood, and especially because, oddly enough, the, the procedure of guided bone regeneration was essentially devised and set up by people who don't speak English. So you know, obviously they're going to get things a little wrong. And the word that I really want to bring to attention is regeneration. So look, true bone regeneration, the only way that we can um, regenerate bone is for the host to do it. It doesn't matter if I, if I actually became very clever, very clever and did very a, a huge number of implants, maybe even became a fellow of the ITI or, or a diplomat of the ICOI, it is still not going to help me to regenerate bone. Only the host can do it. So therefore, we need to work with host healing. This is a fact. When, when people talk about, oh, I did GBR today, uh, they didn't. The host did it. And if you're putting an HA or a xenograft, we're merely integrating these foreign particles into the host. Is that regeneration? No, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, as I say, it's integration. The little bit of bone that grows in between is only the bit that's done by the host. So this is a, actually a really strong ethos that we have and we have with uh, regeneration and healing. And we'll go through this a few times as I'm going along with it. This is logical. This is something if you ran by your kids, they would understand. Um, and I look at it as biologic. All right, This is using logic understanding of biology. So this is why I like to actually sort of say, look, keep calm. Let's think about the first three years or four years of our university, maybe even two years, I think, in second year, when we're just doing biology, physiology. This is what I want to understand. I don't want to understand the bit once we're being told and taught uh, ideals or, or um, procedures that, you know, once finances and once companies become and industry becomes involved. So it's really important that we use our education, but our ed education is not the learning of facts. It is just training our minds to think, training our minds to be open. Because like parachutes, oddly enough, minds work better when they are open. And so it allows us to try and understand what's actually happening, what we're trying to achieve by doing this uh, regeneration of host tissue. And another really important aspect about it, the success of all bone grafting materials. I, I hear people say, oh, the graft failed. And that could be they're using a xenograft in a membrane. It could be anything. It's not the question of the graft material failing. It's a possible lack of uh, understanding the basics of surgery and bone biology. Because, you know, most people can get fantastic results from a number of different materials. And they all work relatively well uh, as long as they're used in the right direction and there's an understanding of what we're trying to achieve. So this is quite an important aspect. One of the most important things is angiogenesis. This is Maya's the key to all host regeneration again. As I said, uh, we can't regenerate anything. The host is. So we want the host to have access to the blood supply. If we look at, we go to high impact medical journals, uh, we're looking here, this is by Pamela Havovich. Again, it's looking at calcium phosphates and angiogenesis implications and advances in bone regeneration. This is looked in our medical. So I often go to medical research. It's really important for us to, to look what our medical colleagues are doing. So therefore, blood supply is an important factor. We know all healing is very critical for blood and allow it to get to the site and bring oxygen, because oxygen is the healing. This is why I've never used a membrane in the last 16 years, five and a half hours in graft. 
because I like the idea that I can work with nature's miracle, and that's the periosteum. And the periosteum is not merely a, a source of blood, which it is. It's 85 to 90 percent of all the blood to the bone is going to be supplied by the periosteum, because in some uh, more dense bones, this, you know, you you drill in and it doesn't bleed at all. Uh, and so it's very important, not just for the blood supply, but this, the uh, periosteum um, induces when we have a fracture or when we, there's a, when we need to repair the bone, it induces the stromal cell derived factors, which are responsible for uh, attracting mesenchymal cells to the healing site, which are going to be our osteoblasts, therefore lead to healing of the bone. So it's really important that we optimize this miracle of nature called the periosteum. Yes, we need a scaffold as well, you know, but uh, when we're putting in HA or xenografts, these big sort of blocks of chunky stuff, yes, they fill the hole. If you want to fill the hole up with something that's going to stay there forever, that's great. Just throw a whole lot of these in. They just break. They just fill the hole. So they're actually effective when we're trying to uh, repair a defect. Yes, they make it a little easier. Because like a, a, a wall, the bricks are taking up a lot of the space, which should be for cement, which would be the bone. So the host bone is only the small amount that actually can grow between the bricks that are going to stay there forever, which is, makes it easier. But I don't think it makes it more successful. What we would like to do is make the whole thing out of host bone. But as you know, building a concrete wall will need reinforcement and and it, it can be a more difficult procedure. It looks easier what we're doing, um, but I think it is slightly more complex. And you know, but with time, I, you know, and I've done thousands of them, and we learn where we can improve and what to start off with. Start off with the easier cases. Here we're using resolvable sutures just to help tend and to help uh, reduce the forces of the periosteum onto the. Uh, of the musculature and of, of pressure onto the grafting site because as we know stability is the key to regeneration so this is what we want to end up with is pure host bone okay so my idea world is yes graft material should be fully bioabsorbed in the ideal situation we may need to have some support in very rare circumstances but the average case this is what I want. And you know what? It's what the patient wants. The patient actually really wants us to end up with, uh, the patient wants to end up with their own bone. When they come in and they say, doctor, can you heal me? They mean return them back to what they were before in a healthy state. So that's regeneration. And oddly enough, the host physiology prefers this as well. We're dealing with living tissue. It needs to be able to turn over. As you know, the skeleton is turned over all the time. So it's nice to have no residual graft material. And when we look at particulates, we look at that list, osteoinductive, osteoconductive, biocompatible. This is great because the ethos is wonderfully biocompatible. I take the sutures out within two days. It's, there's no giant cell reactions that we can see on all our core samples. So and it needs to be totally replaced by bone. This is interesting considering that the, this paper was published by Nicholas Lang, in an appropriate resorption time in relation to bone formation, maintain graph stability, volume stability, that's good, mechanical properties, no risk of disease transmission. These are all ideal things. There's only one material I see that fits into that all, and that's beta tricalcium phosphate. So this is the key to what we're trying to achieve. And this is the man who, uh, uh, Professor de Kruert of Eindhoven University. He's the man who did all the initial work and understanding beta TCP, understanding porosity, particles, shape, and stability of them and how we can optimize them. So we look at the systematic review here by Hong Lei Wang, Hong Lei Chang, after looking at graft and particulates, one of the major concerns is the presence of res residual particles, and not just bone to implant contact, okay? We're not actually doing woodwork. I, I love the way I look at all the research, a lot of the research, especially with xenografts, and how do they measure success? Success is measured with a set of calipers. Look, we're dealing with living tissue. If we're just looking at dimensions, how do we know the success? As Horvath said, that it's 
is not really a true uh, indicator of success if we just stick a set of calipers. As it's living tissue, the quality of the bone needs to be assessed, not just the quantity. As I say, it's living tissue. We need to understand what the cellular makeup, we need to look at the histomorphology, what's the percentage of graft material, how long it's going to be there. These are all things that will have an implication on the long-term success of the bone that the host is regenerating. And when we look at this, you know, we look at the bone to implant contact, yes, it's ideal to have something resolved because what we want to do is have bone in connection with, with the implant, not necessarily uh, graft particles. The other major thing about this research by Hong Mei Wang, Hong Mei Chang, is when we, we look at this uh, systematic review, up to 23% less bone was found in the xenograft sites, whereas with the alloplast, the synthetic sites, there was 22% increase in bone. Now, this is logical. My kids would say that as well. They're 14. They would say, yeah, of course, if you've got a whole lot of bricks in the hole, of course, there's going to be less space for, for the bone. So by having material that when the graft is removed, we're going to increase the amount of host bone in the site. And again, this is an important factor. So we move on to the protocol. This is what we published. Uh, it's on the Ethos website, and uh, it's under the research section at the back, and it was published in 2015, so three years ago. And this is a, essentially a 10-year study of 600 cases, uh, 600 graphs, and um, where we follow the same procedure. And this is what I routinely do. I extract the tooth. Yes, there's some exciting new things for retaining bone, uh, like, like partial extraction therapy. Um, what we can see and what I'll show you later in, in some cases that we'll see, we've managed to achieve very good long-term results uh, using this. And uh, I'm kind of a little more comfortable removing things and uh, regener helping the host regenerate bone. So we let it heal. Why four weeks? Well, at three to four weeks, we get soft tissue closure. And at starting at about five to six weeks, according to, uh, gosh, just suddenly his name's escaping my mind, but it'll come back, uh, Danish guy. Um, anyway, he basically, and I think uh, Dennis Tarno has shown this as well, that at five, six weeks time, we start getting hard tissue uh, modeling. So what we want to do is actually raise the flap when we can get proper closure and then place the implant and graft before the modeling starts so that we start getting a regenerative procedure and an implant in function which the researcher Sasaki shows will upregulate host regeneration of bone at the time. Then we load it 10 to 12 weeks afterwards, again, under the following of Sasaki, which I'll show you the research in a minute. So there's this paper, and it's published. Uh, it's, uh, it's open access, so you can just download from PubMed as well if you want to have a look and just get a better idea of the process that we're using. Uh, here it is, yeah, Lars Schropp, obviously, uh, the Danish guy I was talking about. This study indicates optimal inches, and this was 2003. So this was a long time ago, 15 years ago. And I've been doing implants long enough to know that, although it's a long time, uh, it's a short time in, in a lot of ways. We haven't been doing implants that long in the greater scheme of things. And this study is already showing us uh, the optimal dimensions of alveolar bone would be best to be preserved. And the best way of preserving the alveolar bone is by placing an implant as soon as we can following the tooth extraction. And then when we look at our protocol, you can see here we've raised a flap. And again, with Dennis Tarno's research, you can see papilla sparing uh, flap raising. And we've grafted with ethos. Here, I've taken a little bit more of the calcium sulfate out. But you do that by flooding the 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 mixture i'll talk about different mixtures probably in a in a future time you can make it harder a number of ways to making your uh, ethos set harder one of them is to take the material out of the tube use the minimum of saline um, the other is to mix it with some mix some as it's dried then mix the dried material back into and so what that does is it allows it to set harder if you're building Buckley. But anyway, here's this case, and that's at 10 weeks. So you can see we've got a nice hard regeneration of host uh, tissue at 10 weeks. 10 weeks, this is the way the body works. The body doesn't take six months to grow bone. 
Otherwise, everyone who broke it, broken a leg, uh, would the hospitals be full of people? No, the orthopedics realized the time scale of regeneration, and because we have allowed the access to the periosteum, this allows us to heal faster. Now, when we look at it, you know, often we sort of hear people sort of saying when the site's full of xenograft, uh, wow, it looks like bone, smells like bone, it is bone. Well, no, otherwise this little guy's Batman. The only way to tell what we have is histology, histomorphometry. And we've done numerous studies, multi-center studies, studies, three different histologists, uh, cent histological centers around the world. And we're consistently seeing over 50% new bone at 10 weeks. And this is exciting. This is taken from the center of the site. Why are we seeing this? Well, these materials, calcium phosphates, have a high osteoinductive potential. So they upregulate the host healing. You often hear dentists sort of or dental speakers saying, well, no, there's nothing that's osteoinductive or has osteoinductive potential. Wrong. There's over 190 high impact journals published on PubMed and medicine stating exactly that. So we've got to look at uh, what the, our medical colleagues are achieving. And here's one of them. This is PNAS, probably the highest, um, it's the, the highest rated, most cited journal, medical journal in the world. And again, it's just stating that yes, ceramics are osteoinductive. It's synthetic as an alternative to autogenous bone grafting. This is a well-known factor in medicine. We published a whole lot of papers again in multiple languages, in French, Greek, um, German, Italian. So, you know, uh, these are all published again and all on, on show on the Ethos uh, website. So this is the key about things, is about histology, histology and looking at them. Here's a great sort of von Giesens. And what we'll show later as well is literally, if you look at the center, you can see the graft particles, how the bone is literally growing into these graft particles and replacing the graft with host bone over a period of time. So this is what we want. I mean, sure, if you want a good picture, I have people sometimes saying, well, you know, the sinus doesn't look as good because it's not full of white stuff. Yes, if you want white stuff in your sinus, yes, throw a handful of HA in there, throw some xenograft in the hole. The bricks will look white, and they'll look like bone. We can't fool the body because what the body really wants is true bone. The body wants bioabsorbed material. So when we take an, an X-ray of the sinus, what we see is host bone. We can analyze it. We can see how things are going rather than just taking a picture of a whole lot of uh, you know material that's not host bone. Yes, it looks white, so you can call it bone, but it's not. So we need to make sure that this is uh, an important again if we look at this we see what we'd like to have is bone to implant, implant contact with true host bone again if you look at these graph particles on the right the uh, synthetic you can see that they're being absorbed by the bone and the bone is literally growing into them and taking them away and eventually they won't be there whereas the graph particles on the other side which is in a graph the idea is they will be there for life yes that's the idea that's what they develop to stay there for life um, and under the notion of that we need them there to uh, keep the volume which we don't again and I'll discuss that in a minute later on so because it's a bit boring just talking about uh, um, the ideologies and bone healing and we're going to run through a couple of cases it's a nice case done by my Mines, and we're just going to talk about a little bit about um, about how much to use and not using too much graph material, not building a big thick layer, because unlike putting bricks in the hole where you can stick a whole lot of bricks and it doesn't matter, we're doing host regeneration here. We need the periosteum to be close to the healing site. So there it is, the tooth remove. I like to use these degranulation birds. We sell those as, as, as well, but they're available around the world. Um, and they're very good at cleaning the site. You can see we've lost the buccal keratinized tissue. Um, and when we use the probe, you can see we've got a buccal defect. Now, ever since I've been using these materials, what the one thing I noticed, the side effect is, yes, we, the host regenerates buccal keratinized, attached keratinized tissue for you. So you know what? I hardly ever do a soft tissue graft. I probably do a handful, maybe two handfuls in an entire year of soft tissue grafting. I fix the hard tissue and then the, so the host can do the soft tissue for me 
making nice grafts and nice tissue and I don't have to do anything. We'll see that again in this case because there was no soft tissue grafting. We hardly ever do it. So it's been allowed to heal for five weeks. So the patient was away and now we have a concavity as the modeling started and especially due to the infected nature of the site, the modeling has been a little more severe. We raise the flap again, keeping the papillae. I don't like making big flaps. The bigger the flap, the more you tear the blood supply, the more you impede the host healing. Again, you can see there's granulation in the site. Again, we're going to use the degranulation burrs to remove that. And here we go after it with ethos. We're not going to place an implant, so this is not a standard protocol. We're just going to socket graft, but we've got soft tissue coverage. This is the best way to get the optimal outcome with socket grafting. Uh, we can leave it open, but there's a possibility you can lose graft material. So by doing this, we're going to optimize. Again, we're not going to overgraft the site because we want to utilize the periosteum. So here's the 10 weeks. Yes, it's improved the volume a little bit, but we're going to layer this case. Okay, so we raise the flap and there is the new host bud. And we're going to take a core sample. Again, we want to assess what in the, is in there. This is living tissue. It's important that we get a true assessment of what's inside and so that we can understand what's being regenerated. Okay, and you can see we've already got nice thick uh, keratinized buccal tissue where there was none before or very little. And you can see we've got a new buccal plate literally forming. So when we place the implant here, the bone is still relatively softer. So we're going to use a denser burr and we're going to actually densify and spread the bone, as you can see, instead of just uh, doing a traditional osteotomy. Here we've placed a pelt top implant, uh, I think it was 4.2. And we're going to regraft with a little more ethos and then suture closed. Here is the case 10 weeks later after that. And as you can see, yes, possibly a phrenectomy wouldn't have been a bad idea. But it's not a problem because we now know that underneath this keratinized tissue and this new widened ridge, we have host bone. And this is why we have this nice keratinized tissue forming. Again, we've done no grafting. This is solely done by the host physiology and we've got 75 on this is our penguin um, <coughs> peg and we you know um, so we've got very good stability of the implant we're placing the screw retained we're using a silver plug here <coughs> and this is just to optimize the antibacterial effect when we're doing a screw retained implant especially with an internal head and here are the x-rays showing the case. And again, you can see grafted, placing the implants in the graft and loading. Now, when we look at the histology, it was done by Heine Nagurski and Annette Linder at Freiburg University at the Cell Tissue Foundation. Um, and um, what we notice, is, again, is if you look closely on the right, you can see literally new bone and cellular activity and new bone growing into the graft materials. We've got the same figures from uh, Freiburg uh, that we were seeing from the other studies, and we'll go back into that in a minute, showing the new bone, and we'll discuss this in a, in, in a few minutes on another case. So, yes, we always have to go to the land of the thinkers and the land of uh, um, the gods, Greece. We like to go to Greece. This is where we like to do uh, animal studies there. And here I am with Minas. We're just doing a mini pig study there. Minas is a, a, a genius when it comes to uh, his PhD is in, in dental material, in graft materials, so this is really his topic, uh, and we spent a lot of time together on these things. Here's a calvaria, a rabbit study that we've done. We've done 8 millimeter critical core uh, defects. Some may say 8's not critical. Well, it depends, plus it's easier because you need to optimize the number of rabbits you're going to be uh, uh, sacrificing. So, uh, you know, we, we here is the case showing uh, the end results of the xenografts, and this is, I think, is rabbit five. We'll talk about rabbit five in a few minutes, but first of all, let's look at this eight millimeter cortical defect. On the side, we've used the xenograft, yes, it works really well. Um, it's got a nice hard material in there, and we could easily place an implant. This is at eight weeks on the rabbit, so yes, it's a very successful material and it's worked well in the past. Um, but it's a large percent uh, bovine. Here we've got autogenous, it works well again, but we've lost volume. Finally here, 
is the ethos, and you can see what we have is something really resembling the adjacent rabbit bone. Again, we've got 50% new rabbit bone at eight weeks on the rabbit, um, and it actually looks a lot like because it's actually being turned back to the host rabbit bone by the rabbits. Right, we're going to look at it under micro CT. We've got a Sheffield Medical School. There's a the micro CT machine. And as we go through, this is the xenograft. Yes, it works very well. Um, but we've got reduced, a lot of it is actually bovine bone in there that's nice and hard and reduced amount of uh, host residual rabbit bone. When we look at the ethos, yes, there are still particles. There's fewer as we're going down and more in the center. We notice right in the center is there's a higher percentage of new rabbit regenerated bone. So when we look at this is rabbit five on exactly the same level, uh, look at the two materials, we can see in the center of the ethos site, we've got a very high percentage of new host bone. And this is interesting because this is what we're going to see on our clinical cases with uh, human cases. Again, if you look on the micro CT, again, we can see this. And when we look at the study, we can see that the new bone is forming uh, at the percentage as we losing the residual graft material. Here we go, we look at the, the histology, and we can see on, on the ethos at, the, at eight weeks, we've got a much higher percentage of uh, host bone as compared to the, the Zen graft. This is natural. Just want to show, share with you Marth, Marshall Urist, one of the most important. He's the man who found out BMPs and host healing. He's the man who discovered uh, osteoporosis. This guy's really one of the heroes of bone regeneration. We look at our previous study using vital. Again, as the graft material decreases, the osteoarthritis area increases. This is what we effectively want to do in true regeneration. And when we look at osteoinductivity, the uh, highest osteoinductivity is actually seen in TCP rather than BCP. BCP is a mixture of HA and TCP. Yes, again, it makes it easier because we've got more building blocks. But with TCP, we found that we have a much higher percentage of new, uh, new uh, host bone being regenerated, and this is what essentially we're looking for. Again, these studies are replicated here on the iliac crest in medical research, but sadly there's no uh, xenograph comparative because in medicine no one uses xenographs, so there's no, there's no studies to uh, do any comparatives in, in the medical research world. Um, as to osteoinductivity, yes, this is a pilot study of our own, uh, and we, we're um, attempting to regenerate uh, hard tissue, osteoid, and early bone formation in the muscle tissue of rabbits. We've used a number of materials from, eight, from synthetic HA, TCP2, um, xenografts, and again, the only one that we could see was with ethos, the combination seems to actually improve this osteoinductivity, and we can see new osteoid formation up against the particle sides in the middle of uh, muscle tissue. One last little thing before we'll just go on to a few cases. Uh, again, we're learning a little bit more, and we'll look at a little more histology and work out why we're we going on this uh, ideological route. Um, but really important things that we often neglect, and these are things that are becoming more important uh, when we talk about implant failures. I don't think implants fail. Yes, they do. Sometimes we break a screw or an implant breaks. So I've had three break uh, implants break on me over the years. So yeah, you know, in the, in the 27 years I've been doing implant dentistry, I've had three implants break. So yes, implants do fail, but generally it's the host tissues fail. And that's what happens around, around the implant. So we've got to be looking again, very importantly, about the quality of bone, uh, about the host physiology. And we've got to be looking at uh, um, cholesterol, LDLs, uh, and vitamin D, especially vitamin D3, and see what the patient levels are. Maybe we should be doing more blood testing to improve our um, host physiology and therefore improve our success rate uh, in implants and understand more. And this is why it's important that we're returning the host back to the tissue they once were because we get a better understanding of the material we've created. 
So we're going to just look at an, a, a, another case now. Um, again, trying to learn a little more about things. Yeah, this is by a meniscus case, maybe again a phrenectomy here. We've got a great footage of showing a phrenectomy being done. Then we did a little bit of he did a little bit of phrenectomy here. But again, we've got this three-week healing period, three to four-week healing. It depends on your ability to uh, manipulate soft tissues. Okay, and now. Why do we want to do in this period? Because we don't want to lose bone, especially bone on the interproximal, up against the adjacent teeth, which could be responsible for possible loss of papillae. Now, when we look at the, at the case, we've raised the flap, we've retained the adjacent papillae so that we can try and not disturb the blood supply to those, that was those uh, little cusps of bone that are so important for retaining the papillae. And we're going to place the implant in the optimal position. Look, we don't have to place in these aesthetic zones, we don't have to place the implant way back into the, the palatal aspect where there's more bone because now we can regenerate, we can get the host to regenerate the bone. So we can place the implant in the optimal site for the implant aesthetically. Implant dentistry is a restorative job with a little bit of surgery attached to it. So it's more where we want the crown that's where we place the implant. We try and optimize it. Um, I don't place the implants where the bone is. I tend to place the implant where I want it and try and regenerate, help the host regenerate the bone around the side. Now, this is the interesting thing about this case, which has been published on the, in the EDI journal and I think in concrete in German. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove this bridge of buccal bone. All right, a lot of people is try and keep everything up. Once the... the, the the tooth has been removed, so the PDL supply has been removed, and this is where the benefits of PET comes in, that we're retaining the, the PDL supply to that thin bundle bone. But once we've removed that tooth fully and we've raised a flap, the bundle bone is now dead. The host is going to want need to remove it. So, you know, all we're doing is helping host healing by removing it ourselves. And I feel that if we remove it, it'll improve the aesthetic outcome long term because otherwise if we leave it there, the host will remove it uh, through osteoclastic and macrophage activity and that may compromise the outcome in the long term. So it's better we remove it, in my eyes, and we're going to graft it. Okay, as I said, Ethos is 65% beta TCP, so it is a beta TCP product, not a calcium sulfate product. Yes, there's a little calcium sulfate mixed in it to just give stability and um, to help maybe possibly prevent soft tissue issues. But as again, I, you know, that's another whole story about soft tissue ingrowth. There's no research. I don't think it really exists. Um, the other benefit of using the calcium sulfate, yes, it bioabsorbs at the earlier phase. Calcium sulfate is generally, depending on patient physiology, is gone at three, two, three, four weeks, depending on patient physiology. The benefit in this situation is it stabilized the graft in the initial period of time, and then it bioabsorbs. So it is resorbed earlier, and that creates space for further neoangiogenesis, so further ingrowth of uh, vessels, which can then lead to improved regeneration of host bone. As I said to you in the beginning, this is all about angiogenesis. This is all about allowing the body to heal by improved um, blood supply and improved, uh, literally, as I say, working with this host healing, upregulating the host healing. Um, here's the case at 12 weeks when we're getting ready to load it. And as you can see, we've got an adequate outcome. We take Ostel again, very high thing, 77 in this case, and there's the abutment fitted and the end result with the crown. Here it is one year loaded, and as you can see, it's still inadequate and it's a nice outcome. Will it stay like that? Yes, I'm going to show you 16 years later. And it's again, if the implant is in function, we will retain the bone. And here the, here the bone is, and here's a, a CBC taken at one year. Okay, this is, we're going to look further at another case where we've got CVCT to assess it over the longer term. Is CVCT a good example? No, the only way to tell what we have 
CBT doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you whether you've got bone there. It just shows you've got something white. You've got something radiopaque. It could be something the maid left behind. We don't know. So we need to have histology, histomorphometry to truly assess what our cases are. Here we're going to place the implant, uh, upper, upper six, and I did this case. We've got buccal, mesobuccal, distal buccal defects, and you can see the palatal root. Here I've done the internal sinus lift using desk, and you can see the graft material. So I've mixed the softer material in, and then I've just grafted on the outside, grafted the defects, not putting the, the implant all the way in because we prefer to have a flat platform, so I'm going to grow the bone vertically as well, which will give me a better restorative platform later on. Again, do not overgraft. You do not need to overgraft these materials. And then we just stabilize the graft, stabilize the calcium sulfate with a dry sterile gauze for two to three minutes. I normally get my nurse to hold it while I'm doing something. And then we come back and suture close tension free. Uh, with either monofilament or PTFE sutures, I prefer. So here it is at grafting. You can see how we've now grafted up that two millimeters vertically. And here it is loaded at nine months. And you can see we've got an adequate outcome. I needed to do a sinus on the other side. There was a septum, so it gave me uh, the ethical right to take a CVCT. In the UK, you cannot just take a CVCT to have a look what your case is like. That's not fair on the patient, exposing them to radiation for, uh, you know, to assess the case. That's not, you know, you have to have it sort of needed for a diagnostic planning purposes only. And I think that's quite a good aspect. So when we look at uh, this in 3D now, we look at the case, we can see the new regenerated host bone. You can see that the uh, most uh, by now, nine months, 90, 95% of the graft material, even more, is bioabsorbed. And you can see the new buc uh, buccal plate, the new buccal bone. And again, you can see where the palatal root literally was. We've now regenerated with host bone. And again, if you can see a little bit of new buccal bone on the scan on that, that, that site as well. When we look at it, that's the implant mid-depth, and that's at the, the peak. We can see this regenerative regeneration of the, the new host bone. Again, you can see where the buckle, where the palatal root was. You can see that concavity, uh, convexity, literally, of new uh, bone regeneration there. Now, when we often I uh, see it, uh, here's a xenograph, a friend of mine's case. She did 18 years ago. Uh, it actually looks all right. It looks quite nice. Uh, we've had failure of some implants further back. But if you look at the buccal aspect, this is a xenograph. This is after 18 years. Is this regeneration? I don't think so. Yes, it looks good. The xenograph's holding the soft tissue. It looks really good. A little bit of popcorn effect every now and again. A little particle pops out. A uh, patient just pulls it out. Um, so is it regenerated? Is it part of the host? No. When you see these CVCTs, everyone looks at it and says, Here's the bone. Yeah, it is. It's bone, but it's, it's not necessarily patient bone. And that's why CBCTs have a limited value, and it's nice to be able to look at uh, histology. As we know from the research from Albertson, and, 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 you know, this is why these materials were developed, is they were developed to stay there forever, because that was going to keep the volume. We thought once the tooth was out, the only way to keep the volume was by putting HA. No, but you know what, uh, this has worked out a long time ago. But as I sort of say, the problem really with materials that stay together, they may impede the ability of the bone to turn over and hence become, uh, you know, effectively dead with no osteocytes in the site. As bone is living tissue, it needs to turn over. So we'll look all the way back. This case is a case I did 16 years, 15 years ago now, using the original Vital. This was an orthopedic material to start off with. And again, you can see we're still using essentially the same procedure. Maybe I'd taken the papillae away there. I placed an old Intel implant. This something was developed in 1985, these implants, by my great friend Barry Edwards. And here it is, 12 years loaded. Have we lost the volume after 12 years? No. Look at the adjacent central. Um, so I don't think we need to have foreign HA as something merely to hold the volume. 
And here it is 14 years loaded. Again, you can see on x-ray, yeah, it's an old style implant, old style restoration, but it's good after 14 years. The case is still loaded. He came in the other day. And the reason why we know this, this goes all the way back to Julius Wolf, 1890, 1892, I think was Wolf's law, is that like muscle tissue, if we keep bone tissue in function, the bone tissue will remain and, uh, and, and um, remain and keep the volume. So if we're not planning on placing an implant, but we want to say if we're doing uh, pontic site development, yes, throw some HA in, it'll be beneficial. But where we're placing implants, I feel it's always nicer to have fully bioabsorbed material and the function of the implant itself, as I say, the, the chewing on the implant, this will retain the hard tissue volume and the hard tissue uh, profile. We're just going to look at this as another case. I'm not going to show you the case. Uh, again, we newly uh, formed bone it was 48.12%, just under the 50%. Residual graft material on the histomorphology, 8.1%. Um, but the interesting thing about this uh, case, and, and uh, again, using histomorphology to evaluate, we've got to look at this turning over of a bone to true host bone tissue. And um, we look again at this particle, and again, you can see the graft material literally growing into the particle turning over. I, on, on my other lectures, I've got a really good one. Um, and we've had a really good, uh, sorry, I was just reading something. Uh, we've had a really good uh, case where we've got a graft particle literally surrounded in new bone, and, or you can see all the cellular activity. Uh, as I say, uh, you know, if you want to post a question, anyone, there's a little uh, side area where you can post a question and uh, we'll answer those questions at the end. So when we're looking at, at our study and then we're comparing it to a very similar study done with the same cell tissue department uh, using bovine bone uh, xenograft material, what we notice is, you know, as I said right at the beginning, the logic of it, you know, if we look at what our kids would have to say and their decision and what we would say by looking at going all the way back to biology and physiology if you're putting something in that's going to stay there it's going to take the place of host bone and here we can sort of see if we look on the left hand side the green is the bovine bone material and the red is the new host bone this is done on a similar study yes their study was over a longer period of time because a longer period of time is required when using uh, bovine products. When we take in core samples, we take them at 10 weeks. Again, that's because we're not using a membrane. We've just recently published, a, uh, we're about to publish a study, being published in post, and the full study is about to be published. But when we use a membrane uh, on our rabbit study, there was 50% less new blood vessels in the regenerated side. So this is, again, obvious that uh, bone regeneration uh, without a membrane is going to improve the, the, the um, outcome. Just going to show you a quick uh, um, apicectomy site. Do we graft apicectomy sites? Yes, it will help regenerate the host bone. And in this case, we could probe all the way down. It's a good friend of mine, this patient. And now we can only probe a few millimeters. So it's regenerated that buccal plate. Uh, as well as removing the, uh, helping with resolving the uh, infected site. Again, the good thing about ethos, it's bacteria static as well. Again, I could show you in lots of cases with sinuses, but we'll leave that later on, the uses in infected sinuses. Here's an implant, uh, Intos I placed 24 years ago. I just saw him about six months ago. Yeah, in the old days, it was, it was tough placing these cylindrical implants with no guarded but I'll just end off today with a nice guided case using Peltop uh, with Menas uh, Levensis again. And uh, we can just have a look through and um, see this again. This is an implant where obviously too wide an implant, too big an implant was placed, and we're removing it. Okay, so we're just going to go through the whole uh, planning, uh, we get the planning actually done for us. So I, I just don't have time. I'd love to spend hours playing with computers, but this is a, a great service place, a great service by uh, Pulse Up Implants where you can get your planning done in-house and just receive a nice guide. 
with a sleeve and there's a specific uh, guarded implant system so that there's no room for error or, or reduced room for error. And as again, you can see there's a small buckle defect. This allows us to place the implant with the optimal place for restoration. As you can see, we haven't placed it very uh, politely because what we're going to do is we're going to regenerate the host bone uh, on the buckle using uh, ethos here. Again, no overgrafting, suture closed. When our suture closed, I always suture the papillary area first so that the area flapping can have reduced tension. And here's the case uh, in the final placement there. And here it is ready to load at uh, 10 weeks. We actually loaded it uh, yesterday. So, um, and we will get uh, some nice pictures on the outcome. But as you can see, we've already got nice crack, nice tissue. Everything is healing. Have we done any soft tissue? No, I, we never do soft tissue grafts. This is just the outcome. If we fix the host tissue, the host hard tissue, we let the host do the soft tissue than itself. It's far better at doing soft tissue surgery than I could ever be. So I'd like to sort of um, thank everyone on this webinar. It's gone very nicely, exactly on time. And you know that if everyone wants to, that's my email address. Anyone can uh, write to me and ask questions or any ideas. Um, I'll see if Peter's got any questions. And uh, that's the website, ethos.dental. And if you want to join our Facebook website, Ethos Case Studies, you can post cases, look at cases, and we all assess things. And it, it seems to be a very friendly group. But uh, on that, I'd, I'd like to say thank you. And we'll go back to Peter at the, uh, the, uh, up in Sheffield. And uh, if there's any questions, we'll get on with that right now. Okay, Hi, you. Peter. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we have got a few questions. If anyone else wants to ask any questions, by all means, there's an option on the side of your screen where you can just ask them through there. Um, we've had a few people, Peter, asking questions about the um, membrane side of ethos and how it can work without using a separate membrane. So I don't know if you can talk about that just quickly again. Yeah, well, you know, this is this is often asked. I remember once there was a big MaxFax conference in Athens, and that was the first question asked, and everyone, well, actually, there's 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 no real research about soft tissue ingrowth, and and uh, this is the big one of those misnomers uh, about membranes. Um, membranes are essentially used and devised because initially with xenografts, uh, there, there's more of a cell, uh, um, you know a host reaction to you get giant cell reaction and so therefore the host wants to encapsulate the particles. This is primary reason for using a membrane is to confuse this um, host reaction so to try and stop this giant cell reaction. The other thing obviously sites need to be cleaned well. I think sometimes sites weren't cleaned and then there was granulation tissue around the xenograph particles and finally motion. Movement is the big key because if, if the particles move They'll, the the mesenchymal cells will differentiate to fibroblasts rather than osteoblasts, and so you'll get fibrous tissue. Um, yes, the great thing about ethos is this calcium sulfate element does stabilize the graft, especially the initial period, but it also does make it cell, uh, soft tissue cell occlusive. So this is why I've never used a membrane. Uh, it doesn't seem to have affected my cases, and this is why we can work on a much faster time scale because we a getting blood to the site and b the host recognition of healing is not impeded by by a membrane thanks pete thanks i think we've got time just for one more question as well peter um so we've had one come through that if you're looking at doing something for example a lower molar and you were doing it as an immediate case how would you manage the gap um, between the soft tissue uh, also how would you manage it if a cover screw is being used thanks um, yeah, a lot of people like using cover screws. I, I prefer not to. I know it makes it easier in the second stage, but it's better to get sub, uh, sort of sub-periosteal healing. It's just safer, you know, because cover screws or, or open healing, it's fine in most cases, but in the UK, we're always looking at over 99% success because we have a very litigious society here, I mean, on another level. And, and so we want to get that really high success rate. So even I, I feel when we soccer graft, yes, we show traditional soccer grafts where we extract, clean the site, place the graft straight away with the fleece. 
But I believe that the, the best way to optimize your results, even if you're going to just socket graft, is remove the tooth, let it heal for three weeks, then raise a frail flap, clean the site. It allows you to clean the site properly, and then you can socket graft. Um, you know, we're just publishing that as a new protocol for socket grafting, but what it does is it massively increases your predictability and success rate. And that's that's a really important aspect. So, um, you know, I, I always prefer to do that. Lower molars, I've got hundreds of lower molars. I just didn't have the chance to show you here. Um, we've got dramatic cases, which we'll show you in the next uh, in the next slide. So what I prefer to do with lower molars is um, extract the tooth, allow for a three-week healing, then place the implant into the bifurcation, graft both sides, graft the buckle, don't overgraft, load at 10 weeks. And you'll be surprised at the keratinized, uh, attached keratinized tissue you get. I mean, it's a very predictable uh, area. But again, by allowing the soft tissue to heal, it just improves this predictability so that you can put the flap back over. A lot of guys I know do use healing caps. Um, I think it's it works fine. What the problem is is just some cases, um, it you know some cases there could be an opportunity of of graft loss, and depending on on the skills you have. Again, it goes back to the beginning about optimizing your surgery and uh, understanding of the biology. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for that, Peter. I think that uh, brings us to our time for today. So thank you very much to all of the delegates for coming on the webinar today. A thank copy you. of the presentation will be available. It's been recorded and that will be emailed around to you in the next week or so. Um, if you've got any questions, by all means, contact us or a good option is to log on to the Facebook page that Peter has suggested there, the Ethos Case Studies Group. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.